welcome to J-House, where we interview people we admire who have developed skills and created cool things. We want to learn from their experiences to inspire us in our lives. Today, Elise and I are learning about self-compassion from Dr. Kristen Neff. She wrote the book Self-Compassion, The Proven Power of Being Kind to Yourself. Another one of our favorite books is The Gifts of Imperfection by Brene Brown, and it actually references Kristen Neff's book of self-compassion, and Brene Brown said about this book, it was a transformative read. Well, I've been working with my emotions a lot, so I'm excited to hear from her. Yeah. We've talked a lot on our vlogs about how Kendra and I struggle with perfectionism, and this book, the things that Kristen Neff is teaching about self-compassion has been a big difference maker for us in trying to love ourselves, be kinder to ourselves, and we're excited to hear what she has to share with us today. Yep, I'm excited. We hope you enjoy our conversation with Dr. Kristen Neff. Hello. What is self-compassion? Okay, so self-compassion is very simply treating yourself like a good friend. So if you had a friend who came to you who was upset about something, or maybe like they got a bad grade on a test, or they did something, like they made a mistake they felt bad about, pretty normally you'd be kind to your friend, you'd be supportive, you'd let your friend know that you'd still love them even though they made a mistake. And so self-compassion basically just means treating ourselves the same way. You know, understanding we're imperfect. Everyone make, makes mistakes, it's okay. And then just picking yourself up and trying again. It seems obvious, but why is it that we sometimes aren't kind to ourselves? And why does that become a pattern where our, our default, you know, sometimes our most common way of inner voice is actually negative? Right. Well, so um, it's pretty much because when something is difficult in our lives, when, you know, maybe we get sick or we make a mistake, uh, we get really frightened. We feel threatened, like something bad's going to happen. And so what we do is we like fight and attack the problem because we're scared. The only thing is the problem is often us, right? Because it's us who's made a mistake. And so when we're hard on ourselves, we often think that somehow it's going to make us better. You know, we'll change ourselves so that then we'll be safe in the future. So it comes from a good place, believe it or not. When we're hard on ourselves, it's usually because we're trying to be better people and we just want to be, you know, safe in the world. But unfortunately, it doesn't really work very well, right? So just as you know, um, you know, when you're hard on your kids to try to get them to do better and you're really mean to them, it doesn't make you better. It just makes you want to cry. <laughs> Yeah. And the same thing with ourselves. But when we're encouraging and supportive to ourselves and we let ourselves know that we care, even though we've made a mistake, it actually helps us to do better next time. But we don't know that. And so we just go with what we know. And that's just being hard on ourselves. We think it works. Sadly, it doesn't. <laughs> How can we be more kind to ourselves? Well, so um, luckily we know how to be kind. It's just that we're more practiced being kind to others. So what you can do if you want to be kind to yourself and you just can't think of what to say, you can think, well, what would I say to someone I cared about, like my best friend or maybe one of my family members, if this happened to them, what would I say to them? And you probably already know how to be kind, how to be supportive, like what types of things to say, what tone of voice to use with your friends. And so you can just use that as a model for how to be kind to yourself. So by the way, that, that's one way. Another way, so, so, so not only do we talk kindly to our friends, we often like give our friends a hug, right? You know how when, when you meet your dad or your mom touch you and like give you a hug, you feel safe and secure, right? And it feels good. So you feel that inside when you do that with your dad? Mm -hmm. Well, now try it with yourself. So actually, believe it or not, when you touch yourself, your body reacts the same way. Your body feels warm. It feels cared for. It's not exactly the same as when your parents hug you, but it really, it really helps. So a very easy way to give yourself compassion is simply just to touch yourself, give yourself a hug, or just try putting your hand on your heart or your face, whatever feels good to you. That's a really easy way to let yourself know that you care. Yeah. I've heard you talk about self-compassion being broken down into three parts, you know, kindness, common humanity and mindfulness. And I yes. know those are big words. I mean, even for yeah. me, mindfulness, I hear all these different definitions. Yeah. I, can, so, so we can use simpler words, right? So basically mindfulness is just um, noticing, 
right? Being aware. So oftentimes, let's say we're feeling badly about something um, or some things are really difficult, like we don't stop to notice that we're having difficulty in the moment. Right. So either we're just lost and, oh, I'm so upset about this, or else we're just like working on trying to solve the problem. And like, so again, just like a friend might come to you and say, hey, are you doing okay? <laughs> so mindfulness is just that awareness to say, how am I doing? Yeah. Am I okay? Right. And then so uh, being aware when we struggle. So if we have to first be aware that we're having a hard time. Otherwise, we can't be kind to ourselves if we don't even know we're having a problem. Right. Yeah. So first we become aware of it. And then we respond with kindness, again, just like we would to a good friend. And so common humanity, so it is kind of a big word, but basically what it means is we remember that everyone's imperfect. Everyone has a hard time sometimes. It's actually normal. It's part of life. You know, often what happens when we make a mistake or maybe, you know, you get a bad grade on a test or, you know, you do something you feel badly about, it feels in that moment like, Something has gone wrong. This isn't supposed to be happening. Like it's as if what's supposed to be happening is I'm perfect or my life is perfect. And when it's not, we get upset and we feel all alone, right? And so with self-compassion, we remember nothing's gone wrong. This is, this is part of life. You know, this is how we learn. We learn from our mistakes. Sometimes life is difficult. It's challenging. I'm not alone. You know, as a matter of fact, this is what connects me to all the people I love, not what makes me separate. And so it really helps. Um, it helps when we remember we aren't alone so that we don't like get lost in what's called self-pity when it's like, poor me, you know, woe is me. And when you're saying poor me, woe is me, you aren't thinking about anyone else. Mm -hmm. yep. Self-compassion, kind of by definition, what compassion means is we're all in this together. You know, and so when you remember that we're all in this together, that helps us feel not so alone. Kristen, it seems like one of the easiest times to feel self-pity is in those areas where we really do feel different. I know yes. you've talked about your son having mm -hmm. autism. Elise has dyslexia. How okay. is that? How has that impacted you having dyslexia in doing school and in doing other things? Um, I guess it makes me feel like, I don't know, not as good as everybody else. Because like in some things I'm in lower than or like I go slower on things. So right. it feels harder and like, I don't know, alone, I guess. Because like, yeah. Yeah. Not that many people have it, so. Right, yeah. In, in these kinds of situations, mm -hmm. how can we have more of that compassion when we especially feel isolated or alone or different? Yeah, well, so I'll tell you a little story of what happened to me once with my son, Rowan, who's, who's autistic. And so, you know, there's a lot of autistic people, there's a lot of dyslexic people, there's actually a lot of people with learning differences. So it's mm -hmm. not actually very unusual. It's pretty common to have a learning difference. Um, and I was with him at the park, you know, and it was a really nice day. It was sunny. And all these kids were out there playing with each other. They were like playing tag and hopscotch and, um, you know, games together. And they were also, you know, interacting with their parents. They were running up to their parents and talking to their parents. And it seemed like everyone was having this perfect day. And um, Rowan, on the other hand, especially when he was younger, he was very autistic. I don't know if you know many autistic kids, but um, he was just, he wasn't talking with me. He actually had hard, he was still having trouble talking at five years old. And he wasn't talking with me. He wasn't interacting with me. He wasn't playing with the other kids. You know, he was kind of, um, he was just on the slide and he liked the sound the slide made when he hit it. So he kept on banging the slide because he liked the sound. And, you know, and so I started feeling all alone. I started feeling like, you know, you know, and I have, to, I have to admit it. I started feeling, oh, why me? You know, why can't I have a perfect, happy relationship with my child like all these other parents do? You know, they don't seem to be having problems. And so that, that's a normal reaction. We shouldn't judge ourselves for it. But then I remembered, well, wait a second. You know, maybe it's not autism, but it's surely something. <laughs> You know, every one of these kids will have challenges in their life. Maybe it's some other sort of learning disability. Maybe they'll have physical challenges, right? Maybe they'll get sick. Or at the very least, surely all these parents will have struggles with their kids and the kids will have struggles with the parents because that's what it means to be a family. 
right? So being a family is not about everything goes perfectly until the day we die. That's not what, that's not what real families are, right? And so once I remember that, yeah, so the type of struggle people have is different. You know, not everyone struggles the same way, but everyone struggles. That's really what makes us human. And so the moment I made that reframe, and you know, this is actually what connects me to these other parents. I'm not, you know, the way I feel is different, but actually the fact that it's hard, that's what connects all of us. And then I felt much better because I didn't feel so alone. So it kind of basically says that, yes, each, each way that we suffer is different. Everyone has a different history. Everyone's unique. Everyone on this, you know, in this life has, you know, a unique story, unique history. But one thing that unites us is that we all have challenges. We also all have strengths and wonderful things in our life. I mean, this is part of what's being human. So we're kind of like celebrating um, the diversity of being human. Mm -hmm. Elise, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot. But when we're feeling tough emotions, mom regularly uses the birds. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about what she does? and She uses birds? Yeah, the the example of Um, laying down... And okay. thinking about birds flying across the sky and right. pointing out the emotions that go by. Yes. Uh huh. And like the birds, f- like, because you have a sky and the birds are like the emotion. So, like, let's say anger comes in and he's flying mm-hmm. around and then he'll stay there and then he'll go away. And right. All every, and then once you notice your, the birds, then you notice that well and then you um say that like everybody has um i don't know the angry bird go- flies yes. through sky and yeah. then but it will fly yeah. away yeah yes it, it will fly away here's a trick it's a nice metaphor unless you capture it in a cage and what capturing it in a cage is like is when you judge it So if you say, I'm a bad person for feeling angry, or I'm a weak person for feeling scared, when we judge our emotions, when when it's called resistance, like when we say, I shouldn't be feeling this way, it's like we're putting that bird in a cage. And when we put the bird in a cage, it's stuck, and it actually can't fly away. Mm -hmm. And so you want to know how to let the bird out of the cage? Definitely. Okay. (laughs) You give it kindness. In other words, you say, you know, this is really hard. I, I feel, you know, I, I hear a bird, you're angry. I, I hear you're angry. Okay, that's, first of all, it's valid. Everyone feels angry. Everyone feels sad. So we acknowledge it with kind of awareness. Um, remember that, you know, we aren't alone. Everyone gets angry. Everyone feels sad. It's part of common humanity. But then we're kind. So we might say, it's hard to feel angry. Oh, I'm, you know, I, I'm, you know, it's really hard to feel angry. I care about myself. What can I do to help myself in this moment? And so we're warned, instead of judging ourselves and saying, I shouldn't be angry or I shouldn't be scared. I'm a wimp. It's like, oh, man, it's, this is really hard for me in the moment. What do I need to make myself feel better? And that kindness is like opening the door of the cage. And once we do that, then the cage, then the bird can fly away. I know some people listening who are hearing this for the first time may have some of the common concerns about this new idea of self-compassion, that it can make us selfish or it can make us weak. And I know that there's been an explosion of research on self-compassion over the last decade or two. Yes. Can you let us know, you know, what research has shown about those weaknesses and what the benefits are of self-compassion. Yeah. And so there's, there's over 2,500 studies at this point. So we have a lot wow. of research on self-compassion and there's a lot of um, basically myths or misunderstandings of what self-compassion is that actually get in the way of us being kind to ourselves. So for instance, people think it's selfish, right? That it's, I'm not supposed to have compassion for me. Aren't I supposed to have compassion for you? But what we know is that the kinder we are to to ourselves, the more we feel like safe and secure with ourselves, actually the more resources we have to give to other people. So if I'm beating myself up and I'm saying, oh, I'm such a, like, let's say with my son, if I'm beating myself up and saying, I'm such a bad mother and I hate myself and I can't do it right, I actually, I don't have a lot left over to give to my son. 
Yeah. But the more I can say, yeah, it's hard. It's hard raising an autistic son or, you know, I'm really feeling tired and like, taking care of myself and kind of acknowledging and, and being warm and supportive. Uh, then the more I have to give to my son. So for instance, there's research showing actually that um, parents of autistic children um, who are kinder to themselves uh, are less stressed and are better able to meet their children's needs, right? Sure. Similar for, for nurses and doctors, healthcare workers, they're, they're less likely to burn out and become exhausted when they can be there for themselves. People make better relationship partners. People are happier with their husbands or wives uh, when they're self-compassionate because they're less controlling and they're kind of more self-sufficient in the relationship. So the more we give to ourselves, actually, the more we have to give to others. So that's one. Um, another big one is people think it will undermine their motivation. You know, I'll be lazy. I'll, I'll, I won't try as hard. It's exactly the opposite. Yep. So, so most people try to motivate themselves by beating themselves up, like being hard on themselves. You know, yep. I've got to do better. It's not okay to get a B or whatever it is. And when you're hard on yourself, first of all, it does kind of work. You might study harder, for instance, or you might try harder at your work. But what happens is you're so anxious and worried about beating yourself up that you actually don't perform at your best. And so self-compassion, instead of motivating with fear, like, you, you, you know, you aren't worth it. I won't love you unless you succeed, which is kind of what we say to ourselves. We motivate ourselves with love. We say, first of all, it's okay to fail, but I really want you to try because I care about you. Just like I'm sure your dad motivates you. He doesn't say like, you don't get a good score on this test. I'm going to hate you forever. He probably <laughs> says, hey, I believe in you, but I want you to study because I care about you and I want you to learn. And so we do that same with ourselves. With self-compassion, we motivate ourselves with encouragement and it's actually more effective. And so there's, there's lots of myths. Um, people think it will uh, make them weak. Self-compassion makes you strong. Think about like, um, you know, imagine you're going into a battle. I don't know if you ever watch war movies or something like that, but imagine you're going into battle and you have a choice to go into battle with, you, you, can, you can invite another um, group of army people to come in with you. Either they, they hate you, they cut you down, they shame you. Are you gonna go into battle with someone who shames you and who hates you and cuts you down and say, you can't do it, I don't believe in you, I hate you. Or are you gonna go in battle with an ally, people who say, I got your back, you know, I'm here for you, I'll help you the whole way. What's gonna make you stronger? You know, clearly when you go into battle or when you, and that's kind of a metaphor for when you go into any tough situation, being an ally, being your own friend is going to make you stronger than cutting yourself down and being mean to yourself. And so there's lots of things like that. And so basically the research shows that um, it's the exact opposite of what people fear. Can you tell us about the difference between self-esteem and self-compassion? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so both are ways of feeling good about ourselves, right? So with self-compassion, we feel good about ourselves because we care, we're kind to ourselves. Self-esteem, we feel good about ourselves because um, we judge ourselves positively. We think, you know, I'm smart, I'm pretty, I'm popular, things like that. Um, what we find in the research is that self-compassion is actually a better way to feel worthy and valuable than self-esteem. Because the problem with self-esteem is we have to feel special and above average to have high self-esteem. It's not okay for me to think, you know, I'm popular, I'm pretty, I'm smart, but I've got to be prettier than that other girl or smarter than that other boy. Or, the, you know, I've got to be more popular than the other kids in class. It's not okay to be average. And what that means is that we're always kind of trying to like compare ourselves to others. Are they better than me? And am I better than them? And so uh, at least you may be interested to know that um, uh, bullying, so hopefully you haven't encountered, encountered any bullying, but it usually starts in uh, early adolescence, like between years, early middle school. And the reason kids start to bully others is to raise their self-esteem. The reason they, they're mean to others is because they want to feel good about themselves. They want to feel smarter and better and, you know, stronger than the other kid. And so that's, a, that's one of the problems with self-esteem is we're always comparing ourselves to others. Another problem with self-esteem is that um, it's really unstable. It's like, you know, yeah, so if maybe you think you're smart. And so you feel good when you get a good grade on a test. 
But what happens when you don't get that A that you're expecting? Then you feel yep. bad about yourself. So it goes up and down. And so the self-worth of self-compassion, and we know this from the research, is much more stable over time. You know, it's like, so self-esteem is like, like one of those kind of uh, fair weather friends or like an unstable friend, like they're there for you on the good days, but they desert you when things are difficult. Self-compassion is there for you always. So when you feel, when you fail, when you feel that, you know, maybe you aren't as performing as smart as, as, as you'd like to, or you aren't feeling as pretty as you would like to be, or someone maybe doesn't invite you to a party. So you're feeling maybe you aren't as popular as you want to be. Self-compassion says, I love you unconditionally. You know, I'm there for you regardless, especially when you fail, especially when you're feeling bad about yourself. It's kind of this unconditional sense of self-worth that allows you to feel um, good all the time, even on good days and on bad days. Um, and also, this is a great thing. You don't have to be special and above average to have self-compassion. You just have to be an imperfect person like everyone else. Well, I can do we that. Can do that. <laughs> I can always do that, you know? I'm totally so, good at being imperfect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so so that's why it's actually better, it's healthier than self-esteem. Self-esteem is fine, but it's just like it's, we have it sometimes and we don't have it sometimes. We can always have self-compassion. I also think, too, when self-esteem is built on that comparison how damaging social media has become yes. when the comparison is so much more apparent and exaggerated. Exactly. Everyone else puts up the perfect selfies. They don't put up the selfie where they're, they've got a funny face or you know, <laughs> they aren't looking their best. And so then we think we've got to meet, meet these high standards. Um, so for instance, one of the things that's actually quite sad is um, girls and in, in adolescents tend to have lower self-esteem than boys um, mm -hmm. because they think they're less attractive than boys do, right? And it's, of course, it's not, it's not true that girls are less attractive than boys. But they're the facing all the images of, the standards you know, of magazines. Beauty for girls and... are so much higher. And so yep. girls, like, about, about at sixth grade, um, so about your age, girls start saying, oh, I don't look like her. You know, I feel bad about myself. And it's, it's really tragic because... The images you're seeing, they're, they're fake, you know, they're airbrushed, they aren't real. And so, um, so for instance, we did one study with um, young women in college, and uh, we, we talked about how they felt about how attractive they were and their, their body image, you know, how they felt about their body. Um, and we helped them be self-compassionate. And what it did, not only did it raise their perception of how they look, but their sense of self-worth was didn't depend so much on how attractive they were. They had they had a source of self-worth that was like unconditional. You know, it doesn't matter how attractive I am at the end of the day. You know, I want to be healthy, but what really matters is that I'm kind to myself. And so it helps um, it, it helps people be so dependent on things like body image and, and attractiveness. Yeah, if you could take us through some of the exercises you do to help us feel and experience some of the emotions you're talking about. Yeah, okay. So I'll teach a practice that's called the self-compassion break. You know, so when you get like a break at school or you, you take a break, um, what you can do sometimes is take a break and give yourself uh, compassion. So what it's going to do is we're going to um, kind of call in these three parts of self-compassion, which is the mindfulness, the common humanity, and the kindness. And we're also going to use touch to help ourselves feel connected, okay? And so um, you don't have to, but I like to lead this practice with my eyes closed because when our eyes are closed, we can focus more. So you may want to close your eyes. Okay, so just closing your eyes. You closing your eyes, Elise? Um, mm -hmm. Mine are closed, I can't see. Great. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'd like you both, and anyone who's uh, watching, to think of something in your life right now that's causing you to be a little upset, uh, a little worried maybe, or you maybe you're feeling badly about yourself, something you've done. Okay, so some difficulty in your life. Okay, and just think about what's happening. All right, why it's difficult. How you're feeling. Okay, so hopefully we're in touch with the, with the issue. And the first thing we want to do 
is um, bring in mindfulness or just to notice. So I'd like you to say to yourself, you can say this silently. This is really hard to be experiencing this. You know, whatever the situation is, it's really hard to feel this way. Okay, so we're just noticing and we're calling attention to the fact that we're struggling right now. And then we want to remind ourselves that, you know, difficulties or making mistakes or being imperfect, uh, this is part of life. This is part of being human, right? So you can say to yourself things like, it's normal to feel like this. I'm not alone. Right? You're just reminding yourself of the truth. This is part of being a human being. Uh, but then we want to bring kindness to ourselves. So one way I suggest you do that is you can maybe try putting both hands over your heart if you want. Or else you can give yourself a hug if you want. Or you can hold your face or hold your own hands. So use some sort of touch that you might, you know, normally use with someone else and just try it out. So touching your body. Just really let yourself feel the warmth of your hands and your own support. Okay. Now we want to see if we can bring in some kindness, right? Say something uh, that's just the, what we need to hear right now. And so one way you may want to do it is you may want to imagine, let's say I had a good friend that I really cared about who was going through the exact same situation that I'm going through right now. Right? Let's kind of imagine that was the case. Someone you cared about, they were feeling the same thing that you're feeling. And think about what you would say to that friend Right, what are the types of things you would say? Uh, and also, how, how would you say it? What, what tone of voice would you use? You know, what would your body be like when you're around them? Would it be relaxed or stiff, right? And then, would you imagine what you might say to your friend? What I'd like you to do is imagine saying the same thing to yourself. Okay, it may be something like, you know, it's okay, you know, or um, I care about you, or I'm here for you. What can I do to help? Right, whatever types of kind things you would normally say to a friend, just try saying them to yourself. Okay, and so when you're ready, um, you can open your eyes. So Elise, can I ask you, how was that for you? It was that? felt good. It felt good? Were you able mm -hmm. to think of something and then say something nice to yourself like you would to a friend? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it felt good? Mm -hmm. That's great, that's wonderful, yeah. I feel like it slowed things down for me because what I'm feeling so stressed or frustrated with myself about, there's a lot of anxiety and rush to it. And this allowed me to really take a break and really pause and put yes. it in perspective. That's right. And that's one of the things, especially if you think about when you, when you treat yourself like a friend, you're like taking a different perspective. You're almost taking an outsider's view on yourself. Yep. And, to, and that gives you more perspective and allows you to kind of see the bigger picture in a way that's helpful. And the pause, take, that's what we call the break. You need to take a pause. And, and by the way, in, in relationships, for instance, like if you're having something, or family relationships or, you know, with, with your um, partner, anytime things get really heated, what you can just say is, okay, let's all take a self-compassion break. Yeah. And, you know, whoever's involved, if you just take that pause Remember, this is really hard with mindfulness. Remember that you aren't alone. This is normal. It's part of being human. And then you're kind to yourself. It's like it's like pushing the reset on your computer. Yeah. You know, and it can be it can be really helpful. <clears throat> One of the uh, 
in religion, people often point to the golden rule, you know, love others as yourself. But we so often struggle to love ourselves. On yeah. Sunday, I had yeah. us. You, you don't, don't want to. You don't want to treat others like you treat yourself because you'll yeah. have no friends. You know. <laughs> yeah, and one of the examples Jesus gave in teaching this idea was the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so, for our Sunday meeting, when we were talking about it, I said, "Let's pretend that we are each of the characters in that parable." Yes. Uh -huh. You know, and it changes the whole perspective of it. Yes. Because how yeah. often am I dismissive and I pass right by my own suffering and leave it there to suffer? Exactly. And that helps no one. It certainly doesn't help yourself, but it also doesn't help anyone else, right? The more we can feel like safe and we can feel um, worthy and we can feel um, kind of positively toward ourselves, then every single person we meet, we're bringing that energy to them. So yeah. it's really not selfish. And it's especially important for parents. Um, you know, and I remember with my son, it was so huge because, um, you know, he, he, his autism was quite difficult. He used to have these horrible tantrums. And when he would tantrum, I would just be really kind to myself. I would say, this is really hard. I don't yeah. know what to do. I feel overwhelmed. I put my hand on my heart. And then what I found is when I could do that with myself, he would actually calm down. Yes. So like when I was mad at myself and I got frustrated, I don't know what to do. He would he would tend to more. Yes. But when I could calm myself, he would calm down. So what we cultivate inside also impacts all the people that you know we interact with. We so appreciate your time and we want to make sure we'll put in the show notes links to your book, Self-Compassion, your website. Mm -hmm. I actually just got your workbook, which yes. is on Amazon that goes through steps and you yes, do retreats. It's actually, you can take the entire eight week mindful self-compassion program on your own through in workbook format. And the people have had a lot of, they've, they've said it's very useful. So are there any yeah. other places people can go to find you or follow along on your journey? I think if you if you Google self-compassion, you'll find me. And then if you're serious and you want to take more training for my website, you can go to the Center for Mindful Self-Compassion. And like you can take an online course if you want to take a deeper dive into self-compassion. Perfect. Well, Elise, do you have anything else you wanted to say to Dr. Neff before we let her go? No, I'm just happy we got to talk. Perfect. Oh, good. I was, it was lovely to talk with you, Elise. I really appreciate mm -hmm. it. And you too, Jeremy. Thanks for your work as well. I mean, being a real pioneer in this space, which you have been, we appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Have a nice Bye -bye. day. So what stood out to you? What did you think about doing that exercise and talking about self-compassion? I liked it, like everything went away. Like all the bad stuff went away almost. Why do you think we don't do that more often? Why do you think we struggle to be kind to ourselves? Probably because to think about like saying to yourself, comforting yourself sounds super weird. Mm -hmm. Like saying like, it's okay, like it's... Like hugging yourself can be weird too, but it yeah. actually felt soothing, good. it felt yeah. good. It's just you don't think to, of doing it, so yeah. So just a reminder, the three steps of self-compassion are kindness, connecting with the shared humanity or common humanity, mm -hmm. and then mindfulness, being aware and paying attention to what you're feeling yeah. in the present moment. I love you. Love you. Thanks for joining us today. If you liked what you heard, we'd love for you to leave a podcast review. Thanks for listening. Jay House out.